So uh, welcome to the maintainer track session for Operator Framework, where we're going to explain to you what's new, what's happening over in Operator Framework land. So by way of introduction, my name is Jonathan Burkhardt, and I work for IBM. I'm one of the uh, steering committee members of Operator Framework. Uh, and then also here we have Austin McDonald from Red Hat, also a steering committee member. Uh, Alex Green from Red Hat, also a steering committee member. And uh, Varsha from Operator SDK, she's one of our maintainers. OK. Uh, in case you have forgotten what we look like, that's what we look like, so. <laughs> okay, so show of hands here, who here has used any of the things on this page? Have you ever built an operator? Do you know what an operator is? Have you ever used, okay, so pretty much everybody here is at least passingly familiar with what we're going to be talking about today. But in case you aren't, what is an operator? An operator is a design pattern for deploying software on top of Kubernetes. Uh, rather than statically deploying your software by, you know, writing a pod spec and running that on top of a Kubernetes cluster, uh, what if we taught Kubernetes how to make your thing by extending the API? And then we would provision and interact with those resources the same way we interact with the normal Kubernetes core resource types. So I'm sure we're all familiar with uh, kubectl create. You can use that to push pods. Well, we're going to teach Kubernetes to kubectl create your thing. And then there's going to be some process that lives somewhere that's uh, called a controller that's going to see those new objects being created and is going to go make them happen, whatever that means for your thing. Uh, so operator framework, the stuff that we make, is a open source collection of tools uh, that is designed to make this task easier. Uh, so we have a variety of tools that we offer that we're going to be talking about today uh, that can be used to basically all parts of the life cycle of these operator software things. Uh, so we're going to talk about Operator SDK, which is a CLI that lets you build and scaffold operators. Uh, we're going to be talking about Operator Package Manager, which lets you distribute them. Uh, and then finally, we're going to talk about uh, Operator Lifecycle Manager, which lets you manage and upgrade uh, operators on clusters. And we're going to be talking about uh, things we've been working on on these things, future plans, uh, and then we'll probably have some time at the end for some questions. So without any further ado, I'm going to pass this off to Austin to talk to you about Operator SDK. Hello. So of course, all of you here know that the Operator SDK makes it easier to build uh, Kubernetes nat uh, native applications. And uh, hopefully, you don't have to know as, as much as you once did. Uh, so I'll be talking about our plugin architecture, uh, the new bundle format, and how you can be validating those operators. So uh, one of the things that I've encountered with people coming to the booth is that they're not aware that the operator SDK and KubeBuilder are now on the same team. If you're scaffolding a Go operator, uh, you're basically going to be getting the same stuff that you'll be getting from KubeBuilder because we've fully integrated. And we've done that by introducing a plugin architecture, which means that all of the new cool stuff with KubeBuilder automatically comes down to us. So I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the new plugins that were written for us by a Google Summer of Code. Uh, we had two interns doing that for us. So first of all, uh, we've got the Grafana plugin. Uh, if any of you came to my talk on Wednesday, one of the best practices for developing operators is to start collecting metrics early in the development cycle so that you can track how that performance changes over time. Uh, with the Grafana plugin, it will automatically scaffold for you the configuration that you need to plug straight into Grafana. So not only are you collecting uh, Prometheus metrics right out of the box, you can now visualize those metrics right out of the box. Um, and we need to thank T and Tony for writing that for us and uh, hire him. Uh, next up, we've got the deploy image plugin. For the most basic use cases, if all you need to do is deploy an image, uh, this will do it for you. It basically would get you through our entire tutorial right out of the box. Uh, and we have to thank Nikhil Sharma for providing that to us. 
Uh, next up, we've got a new bundle format, which is, uh, or a catalog format, which you don't really need to know too much about because the operator SDK will handle it for you under the hood. Uh, but what you can think of is that a bundle can represent an operator. It's just a set of manifests. And then a set of bundles or operators is a catalog. Uh, this catalog is going to be more human readable. It's no longer going to be an SQLite which hopefully none of you had to deal with those problems, uh, but more on that in a bit. Uh, and the last thing that I wanted to talk to you all about is that uh, you can use external validators now with the operator SDK. Uh, this is particularly valuable to pipeline teams uh, validating operators, uh, but instead of being forced to use the validators that are provided in the binary for the operator SDK, you can now write your own validator, you can use validators that are provided anywhere on the web, and you can run them externally to make sure that your operator bundle is going to be doing exactly what you need. Uh, and if you want to learn more, uh, you can obviously go to our website, which hopefully you all know by now. Uh, you can have a look at the QBuilder plugins, uh, and uh, also be sure to go to the Operator Framework community page, which is not on here, but it is uh, GitHub Operator Framework org slash community, and that will list all of the places, all of the meetings that you can get involved, and I hope to see all of you on the mailing list. Uh, so next up, we've got Varsha. Okay, so now that we know what Operator SDK does, let's look into Operator Package Manager, our OPM. So the main task of OPM is to distribute operator content across clusters. So OLM initially used the format of having SQLite-based registries where we had operator catalogs. Now, we had indexes where we had uh, operator images, and we had the process of fetching content through that and distributing it. Now, unfortunately, the APIs which OLM exposed were insufficient enough to enable operator authors to look into a bundle or to even debug it. Now, imagine the daunting task of download, uh, downloading an image locally and tarring it, and then typing a bunch of SQLite commands, and then reaching the point where you can debug a bundle. Now, that seems a very daunting task for an operator developer. Now, a solution for this were file-based catalogs. The main goal of a file-based catalog is to enable better catalog editing, verification, and extensibility. Now, as the dependency scale and uh, we have a lot more releases in a bundle, file-based catalogs become a little bit more complex. Now, veneers were introduced as an approach to make the interaction with file-based catalogs easier. So we have two kinds of FBCs. One is the basic, sorry, we have two kinds of veneers. One is the basic veneer format, and the other is a semi veneer format. The basic veneer format is pretty straightforward. It helps in bundle identification. It basically lists out the bundle images, which can then be extended into a full file-based catalog. And the semi veneer is a little bit more opinionated and a little bit more complex. So as the dial suggests here, uh, it's, it has an increased automation level. So it not only lists the bundle images, it also gives a holistic view of the channels and the bundles which are being promoted inside the channel, the packages, and an interesting feature which operator authors would love the most is a visualization of an upgrade cycle. Now, upgrades are always painful. So we have a solution for it through the opium alpha render graph command. Now, alpha render graph command generates a mermaid output of visualizing upgrade graphs, and this way operator authors can actually verify whether their upgrade cycle looks like what they want it to be actually in the production environment. So we have a lot more discussion going on about this, and we have documentation on file-based catalogs and veneers, so please do have a look at it. Now, um, I'll pass on to Alex. Hello, KubeCon. Um, hi, everyone. My name's Alex. I've been working on OLM for about four years now, and it's been a great pleasure uh, working on that project. 
For those of you that don't know, OLM allows you to extend the Kubernetes API by installing operators onto it. Uh, what this looks like in practice for you guys is you create an operator with the operator SDK, you then package it with OPM, and finally you ship it out to your customers. OLM would notice that you released a new version and would notify all your customers that an upgrade can commence if they're on a previous version or allow them to install the new version of your operator. And that um, ability to push releases that developers off their cluster make to customer clusters has been very powerful and well received by the community. So with that in mind, Alex, you have this incredible powerful feature so that you can allow operator authors to push content to customers' clusters so that they're using the latest and greatest. Why would you ever want to update OLM's APIs? So frankly, OLM has been in the game since CRDs have been in their beta format. A lot of the design decisions that we made early on in OLM's development life cycle were based off of assumptions in terms of where we thought CRDs were gonna go. Early in OLM's development cycle, CRDs had no versioning, they didn't have conversion webhooks, and a lot of these other nuance changes really affected the attack plan that OLM had in terms of the experience we were gonna to give to customers, especially when you apply it to our multi-tenancy uh, solution. And so with that knowledge that CRDs have evolved a lot and OLM's management of them has changed over time, it's been very difficult to create a set of APIs that are both backwards compatible with features that we released and new features that take advantage of updates that have happened in the CRD space. So some of the design decisions that we had made back then, we simply wouldn't make knowing what we know now, although they made sense at the time. And so what are the new APIs gonna look like? OLM's API surface right now is very large, and when you jump into it, you have to know a lot about how to use OLM before you can use it effectively. And so what we hope to do is break OLM down into a set of core features that facilitate very focused features. These tightly scoped controllers will be able to be used independently to fulfill their intended purpose or can be used in conjunction with one another to fulfill a more robust experience when installing off-cluster stuff onto the cluster, okay? So, there are basically three APIs that we are actively developing and welcome you to get involved with and contribute to. First, there's gonna be the operator API, and you can think of that as your landing page when using all these components together. It's gonna to act as a viewpoint for understanding what can, what's available for installation, what's currently installed, um, what resources are associated with what's currently installed, and stuff of that nature, right? holistic view into the entire ecosystem of stuff. We are then gonna introduce DEPI. DEPI is effectively a SAT solver. What, oh, it's a generic one, so other projects will be able to use it as well. But at a high level, OLM is gonna use this as a way to ask, hey, I have some constraints which include installing this operator at this version. Based on the stuff that can be installed, can I install the, something that meets those constraints, okay? And the third component is Ruckpack, and Ruckpack is simply in charge of installing a set of manifests. So, Ruckpack, installing a set of manifest. It, notice that I didn't say it's in charge of installing operators. What is an operator? An operator is simply a set of manifests, one of which is a CRD that extends the Kubernetes API. We've mentioned that the ability for, to allow our developers to create a solution and package it and then share it with all their customers is really powerful. We do not want to limit ourselves by requiring that it has to be an operator. So Ruckpack is gonna be a generic way to retrieve off-cluster stuff and install it on your cluster. So what are some of the concepts that we've been working on within the Ruckpack space? The first one is the bundle CRD. Now, Austin had mentioned this earlier in our presentation, but a bundle is a collection of stuff 
that defines a version of something you want customers to use, right? So a bundle points to a set of manifests that you want to install, or right. Now, the second CRD, it's called the bundle deployment CRD. A bundle deployment effectively points to a bundle, which again, specifies a set of manifests that you want to install on the cluster. So if you point the bundle deployment at a bundle, it's going to install the stuff. Okay? Perfect. And then the final piece that makes up this solution, which is my favorite part of the whole design, are the concept of provisioners. Provisioners are effectively controllers that subscribe to the design philosophy behind Rockpack. They serve two purposes. One, they're able to retrieve off-cluster content, defined as a bundle, and two, they're able to install stuff defined by a bundle onto the cluster. So there's an aspect of reaching out and getting the stuff available for install, and then there's the aspect of actually installing it. This is extensible. You can write your own provisioner, and we'll go more into that soon. You can think of this as a BYO provisioner model. So what does this look like today? So today we're gonna look at, um, on the left side of the screen, we're gonna see a example of a bundle deployment. Within that bundle deployment, the first field in the spec is the provisioner class name. Each provisioner will have a unique provisioner class name that allows the provisioner to effectively know like I am supposed to handle this bundle deployment. So if in our example, we've written the plain provisioner. And so any provisioner cl class name that is equivalent to core rock pack IO dash plain is gonna be reconciled by our plain bundle provisioner or bundle deployment provisioner. If that name did not match what it's what it set to, the plain provisioner would leave the bundle deployment alone. This would allow you to specify your own provisioner and reconcile the bundle deployment. The next thing in the spec is the template. Bundle deployments allow you to specify bundles in the spec of the bundle deployment so that you only have a single surface that you have to interact with. This is nice for a development model where you just want to define it in line. It gives you one API you have to create or one CR you have to create. Alternatively, you could point to a bundle that's on cluster. And so in that template, you'll see that the template has a spec and there's a source. The source type is how you define where, where, where the bundle content's gonna come from. And in this case, we're looking at an image type. And then within the source structure, there is an image and a ref field, and the ref field points to the image that needs to be pulled down and unpacked, right? And once again, you see the provisioner class name. It's the plain ruck pack provisioner. So again, you could use any combination of provisioners to retrieve the stuff off cluster and then deploy it onto the cluster. So it's a very uh, plug and play kind of system, right? Bring your own provisioner. Now, what does the image actually look like? You can see that on the right side of the screen where there's a single directory called manifests and a whole bunch of resources that need to be deployed. Those are the resources associated with the version of the thing that you want to install. So those, that is the bundle that is ultimately gonna be deployed onto the cluster. What's really cool about the plain provisioner is that if anything follows that format, it can effectively apply it. So the plain provisioner today supports you specifying an image that has a manifest directory in the base level, and then it will apply the manifests you could just as easily point it at a GitHub repository. It will pull down the little repo or look at it. It will look for a manifest directory and it will apply this stuff in there. And I believe you can also point it at HTTP endpoints. And as long as it's set up with a directory structure, you're good to go. One, some other provisioners that are actively under development right now are a Helm chart provisioner. So effectively you can specify charts and uh, you know, the bundle deployment spec has a blob that allows each provisioner to kind of define their own spec. And you can supply a values field and then you can do all the key value pairs that you want to inject into it. So that allows support from other 
Helm charts that are already available. With that, that's everything I wanted to say about RuckPack, and I'm going to hand it off to Varsha so that she can talk about Deppy. So a bit more about Deppy. It's the most interesting module out of the whole structure. So okay, uh, Deppy is basically a Kubernetes API, which is an independent module that helps in dependency resolution for RuckPack-based bundles. So what can it do? It can decide on what to install. It can decide if a set of constraints can be met. And it can identify any dependencies. Basically, if I have or if a user has to install an operator, it can check and tell me if the operator is installable without breaking any other dependencies uh, present in the cluster. Uh, just as a note, uh, this project is still under design discussion. We are uh, brainstorming a lot about it. So we do welcome you all to give your inputs and suggestions. So we have GitHub repositories for Ruckpack and Deppy, and we have independent uh, Slack channels, Ruckpack Dev and Deppy Dev. So please do uh, give your thoughts and suggestions on how you would like OLMv2 to look like. And uh, just as a note, uh, I know today is the last day, but we do have interesting demos on a few of the topics which we all spoke about. So please do visit our booth. Um, it's the operator framework booth. And yeah, please provide your feedback on our talk and um, on future talks, which the topics which you would all like to listen to. And I think we do have time for a few questions. So any questions? Yep. Uh, we couldn't quite hear. One, one more time, please. Yeah, so, so do we have any tighter integrations with uh, open tracing or open telemetry for operator SDK? Not that I'm aware of, but uh, with the plugin architecture, if there, if you have a specific need, um, it would not be very complicated to add a new plugin. Um, but do mention that in our Kubernetes operators channel in Kubernetes Slack, um, or actually, a better place might be the operator SDK dev channel in Slack, and uh, possibly we can uh, create an issue and see if we can meet that need. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, can you spend a little bit of time on how easy to debug uh, the operator? I think someone mentioned debug, but a little bit of insight into you know how easy it is to debug. Uh, do you mean like an operator itself, or like building an operator with operator SDK? and operate itself. Okay, so who here has ever tried to run a pod and it blows up and you're not really sure why the pod's not starting? So you start, you know, kubectl logging and you see, oh, uh, it's timing out when trying to pull the image or for some reason the Docker container's not starting or that sort of thing. It's, it's, it's pretty much like that. Um, so, I mean, it also, I suppose, depends on how, how much logging you're doing in your controller. Uh, but it's, it's basically the same workflow. You've got some sort of resource that is probably a thing running in a pod somewhere, and you have a controller that's responsible for reconciling it. And you've got to look through the logs in the various places to see, oh, where is it getting stuck? Where, you know, why is it causing it to just sit there and not actually come up and run? Um, so if you're familiar at all with like debugging like just applications running on Kubernetes, it's a very similar experience. Does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. Anybody one, else? Oh, sorry. Oh, one thing I might add on to that is that the SDK and possibly Builder, I forget if they do this, but they provide the ability to actually run your operator from the command line. What this effectively looks like is that, you know, it uses your cube config and it will just run the code like you know, any code would run on your computer and it will use the cube config that you supplied. And so you can do rapid development, just testing to make sure that it's receiving events against the API and reconciling them. 
um, without even spinning up a pod. So you can just control C out, make a change, spin it back up, and it just allows you to really quickly iterate on the you know, state and status of your controller. I've got one more hot tip. So apparently CERN has an operator to deploy all of their Drupal-based websites, which is apparently like a thousand websites or something like that. Um, and they have a really interesting pattern where they add an annotation um, that tells the operator to stop. So basically you could tell the operator to stop at any point in your reconcile loop, uh, which is a really great way to get in there and get some fantastic debugging at exactly the moment that you need it. Uh, you would add this to your reconcile loop uh, by hand uh, in a development. You wouldn't want this in production, uh, but you can think of it as like uh, a, a GDB statement uh, that will just stop the operator in its tracks right then. Uh, so it won't be adding any more logs. It won't be being noisy anymore. And the last thing that you'll see in the logs will be the bit of information that you're interested in. And just to add a bit more to it, uh, we do have a scorecard testing framework where basically you can test your operator um, on cluster without actually deploying it. So it's more kind of validation where you can write a particular set of rules to check if this is what is expected and if, it's that, if that's what is happening before you send it to the production environment. I guess my question for existing V1 users of operator SDK, what does the upgrade path for V2 look like? So, so are you talking about OLM in the upgrade? I guess, you know, it's smooth sailing or? Yeah, it should be pretty seamless. We have a registry V1 provisioner. So once again, you can write a provisioner to handle whatever format you like keeping your stuff in, right? So the registry V1 provisioner is aware of CSVs. And so it is backwards compatible. I think there's like some nuance there, but it should it should be relatively painless. I also haven't played with that. From oh. the operator SDK side of things, assuming you use that to generate your bundles, uh, the plan is it's going to be completely seamless. Uh, you're gonna you know cut a new version of your operator. You're gonna generate a bundle for it, and the interface and user experience should be literally identical. Although different stuff will be going on behind the scenes, so you hopefully shouldn't notice a difference. Hello. Oh. oh, here we go. Okay. Sorry, one last note. So th this is a feature that I kind of just glossed over, but uh, the existing bundle format is whitelisted, so you can only accept certain resources inside the bundle. With the plain provisioner, it's currently uh, anything. So uh, there's no longer a limitation there. If you have something you want included in it, you can just throw it in. Uh, this support will be provider, sorry, provisioner dependent. Thank you. Uh, so thanks for the presentation of LLM. And I have a question probably because I was not quite following uh, the idea of LLM because so for basically before that, if we have to create an operator and we want to deploy it, we possibly will try to first install the CRD and deploy the operator. And then I guess the OLM has helped to resolve the overall process and you can just use one stop command and try to over, uh, cover all of the things like that. So my question is like, if we do want to deal with that, like what is kind of the difference between we want to wrap it in the Helm chart versus we deal with it in OLM. And if we run this in the operator, and is, is it possible that we uh, drive the operators through LLM, which that is not scaffolded by operators EK, but it's rather like a customized operator? Thank yeah, you. so I'm gonna answer that second question first because it's a little more scoped. Uh, um, OLM doesn't really, as long as you package it in a format that OLM, like V0 supports, which includes a CSV, you, OLM will run it. Uh, we, we, we don't care if it, how it's written, it just needs to be packaged the way we want it. But with the new model, it no longer, because of provisioners, right, where you can define your own format for deploying stuff, there's no longer that limitation. You don't have to include a CSV for OLM to know how to manage it. Now, with that said, in terms of like why you would use 
Oh, uh, can I jump in real quick? Go for it. I have another thing to say about the second one. Um, so if you if you have a non-operator SDK operator, uh, it's also fairly trivial to add the little plugin points so that you can then use operator SDK to generate a bundle for it. That's pretty easy. Yeah, SDK does make it very easy to build a bundle that uh, subscribes to the old packaging format. Um, and they will do it for the new one too. And so going back to your earlier question, why would you use OLM versus Helm? So I think they've served slightly different purposes and they're both great tools that you can use to meet your needs depending on what they are. What OLM really tries to emulate is that you have, you have bought in to a new cluster admin on your cluster that's going to automatically know when new versions of things appear so that it can move it along. It handles the upgrade automatically if you want it to. You can do it in a manual mode where you just click OK, yep, approve the upgrade. And the, the ability to subscribe to the latest and greatest is a really powerful on-cluster thing. Uh, if there's a thing that breaks, OLM is going to recover. Like if you installed an operator and something somebody deleted it, OLM is going to come in and recreate it so that that service is still available on your cluster. That means uh, DevOps teams aren't going to get pinged and be asked to like go in and fix this thing after it breaks. And one last thing is that Helm has sh somewhat shied away. They released an official statement saying that they're not giving full support to CRDs as a resource. Uh, CRDs are very difficult to version, um, largely because when you introduce a CRD, you're introducing a new API, meaning that people can create resources. And these resources are stored in etcd. And when they're stored in etcd, there's only a single version of your oper uh, CRD that's actually stored. So as you introduce new versions of the CRD, there is a potential to invalidate the existing CRs in the etcd database. And if you invalidate them, that means they can't be updated until they subscribe to the new storage format. And what OLM does, which is kind of cool, is uh, it doesn't do it before you kick off the upgrade, but once you kick off the upgrade, OLM will say, hey, this upgrade includes a new CRD version, that's the new stored version, that new stuff, uh, there's stuff on cluster that does not match that new format, so upgrading will invalidate that stuff, so I'm going to block the upgrade until you fix those existing CRs. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, the, the, that's really great. Actually, we were facing problems with the upgrade of the CRDs. Um, so does it care, take care of like the admission checks as well in somehow or like how, how does that pan out actually? Can you define what you mean by admission checks? And what so context? the admission server, basically all the checks in like we, we have the admission webhooks, right? Like the mutating and validating webhooks like that. that it, are those also encompassed in the like the operator uh, like bundles? So you are able to, even with the existing OLM version, you are able to find uh, admission and conversion webhooks, right? Uh, so there's no issue there. We, I will like add in an asterisk and say that we only support it with self-signed certificates from OLM, which can be like kind of you know wonky. But, so I would just like know that in advance. But the uh, so yes, they like if you create an admission webhook or a conversion webhook, it will be there, and we will handle the upgrade and installation of those things. I I do recommend in general though moving away from webhooks and looking up the CL or CEL expressive language that's recently been introduced to CRDs. Uh, webhooks can be fairly dangerous if they ever are not available. You effectively bork garbage collection, like Kubernetes garbage collection, and that can. Uh, really cause some problems on a cluster in terms of resource consumption. So uh, I, I, I really encourage anyone who's writing a CRD to look at the new CEL uh, expressive language that has been introduced. Oh, totally, yeah. I, but now's a good time to start moving to it because it's out. <laughs> I think that's time. Yeah, that's all the time that we've got. So uh, we will be around to answer questions at the booth. Um, we are going to head down there right now if you want to follow us. Thank Thanks you everybody again. for coming. <laughs> <laughs>